Okay. Hello and welcome to the Parsha class. Two Parsha today, Nitzavim and Vayelech. God willing, uh, next week, um, although there's only one Parsha next week, and that's Hazinu. It's really not even for next week. Next week is uh, Baruch Hashem, is the new year. And uh, however, uh, so next week's class will not be a Parsha class. Next week's class is going to be a class on Rosh Hashanah and uh, in preparation for that. Uh, and, but tonight's class on the Parsha of Nitzavim and Vayelach, it's going to be very Nitzavim focused, as you'll see. Uh, however, um, it should be noted that it is in preparation. Even these parshiot are in preparation for the coming holiday, because as Chazal told us, we read Parsha Nitzavim always the Shabbat before Rosh Hashanah. So that's uh, that's that's a rule. Whether it's because obviously it's uh, without a, you know without a, playing games, it's obviously because the Tochacha, the imprecation of last week's Parsha of Ki Tavo is uh is uh is obviously uh, supposed to be read a week before a week before Rosh Hashanah so Nitzavim which is also obviously the next parsha but it's actually related there's not it's not a it's not just a coincidence Nitzavim is the continuation in a lot of ways of Kitavo because in Kitavo there's a Brit there's a covenant that the Jewish people are presented with and the Jewish people accept that covenant in Parsha Nitzavim, that's the that's really the whole point of the Parsha. It's a very short Parsha, by the way. It's uh, only what is something like forty psukim, forty verses. Vayelech is thirty verses. It's a, uh, it's I mean, just those two Parsha alone are shorter than uh, than the curses in uh, the previous Parsha, the sixth Aliyah alone. So. With no further ado, we'll get right into the actual parshiot. This is the last parsha class of 5783. God willing, the next parsha class will be on both Ha'azinu and Vizota Bracha, and it's going to be before Yom Kippur. So it'll be uh, two Thursdays from now. I'm not sure if it's going to be at night or in the morning. Either way, uh, whatever it is, uh, hopefully you'll either be able to see it live or on Memorex. That's a joke. Uh, li live or on YouTube later on. Uh, Memorex for those. Like... Yeah, that's a kind of cassette. Okay, right. used to be used to be an advertisement. All right. Is it live or is it Memorex? Okay, so I'm sharing the source sheet with you. Um, we have quite a bit to do today, so we're going to try to be quick, but obviously we can't be too quick. There's some deep philosophical ideas that we need to get over and uh, and understand to better understand the Parsha, better understand the Torah, and better understand, of course, as always, our relationship with Hashem. So with no further ado, let's get right into it. First verse of the Parsha, Atem, Nitzavim, Hayom, Kulchem, all of you are standing today. In front, lefnei Hashem elokechem. In front of Hashem, your God, Rashechem, Shivtechem, Ziknechem, Shatrechem, Kol Ish Yisrael. Your your the your leaders and your judges and your elders and your officers and everybody, the masses, everybody is uh, is sitting together. And uh, uh, that's an interesting choice. Um, why did I do that? Uh, is that the right source sheet? Yes, it is. Um, hmm. I didn't really have anything. Any uh, so that, that's that's where it's up and begins. And uh, and of course, it's important to notice that we're talking about all of the Jewish people. There are of course different classes of people, but none of these classes are. You're uh, are something you you're born into, and none of them are something that you can't fall out of. It's an important thing. One of the beautiful things about Judaism is that, although we do have, of course, Kohanim, and we have we have priests, and we have Malachim, we have kings. Nevertheless, the truth is, in most areas of life, there is some sort of social mobility. You're not stuck where you are, and there's an opportunity for growth, and everybody's uh, everybody's contribution is important. Uh, we're going to skip ahead uh, about 20 verses 
to chapter 29, verse 28. And I just want you to notice that there's a lot of dots on top of a few of these words. And uh, the verse is also awe-inspiring. And, of course, it's incorporated into our tefillah of uh, the Shemona Esrei of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So it's already relevant, worth mentioning. The hidden things are for Hashem. The things that are not hidden, the things that are public, that are obvious, are uncovered for us and for our children. Ad olam forever. For us to do this Torah. So there are different ways to understand what it is that's hidden and that's for Hashem. And the not hidden stuff is for us. What, what are we talking about? So either it's talking about sins and Hashem deals with the uh, the sins people don't know about the 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 uh, the, the the secret the um, in the closet sins versus the public sins. So okay, that could that could be that's that's one interpretation. Uh, another interpretation is we're talking about different kinds of Torah, right? There's a, there's a hidden Torah that's so deep and so mystical we don't understand it, and there's there's a way to learn on getting close to that you know approaching that level at least it's worth mentioning and uh and then for some things are uh are for uh, but the, the other things that the, the reveal is for everybody there's not a single normal piece of torah that's not for everybody yeah in other words uh the the entire tanakh and halacha and and basic torah without getting any into any deep mystical stuff any any child should be able to learn it. There's, there should be no nothing hidden, or uh, there should be nothing taboo. There are things you shouldn't learn, maybe in public, because people might joke around about it. But certainly, there is no Torah that isn't for everybody. So that's uh, that, that's an important idea. Also, that's that's hinted to in this parsha. But I wanted to show you something in the Gemara in Sanhedrin. The Gemara in Sanhedrin, forty three b. Uh, mentions it asks the question and quotes this verse and he saw Lasham Alkin Niklod Lan Ulvanino Ad Olam Lama Nikud Al Lanu Ulvanenu. Uh so why are there dots? The Gamora asks on Lanu Ulvanenu. You see this these words here, they have dots in the Masoretic text. That's not in the Torah scroll. There are no dots in the Torah scroll, but in the Masoretic text, that's the that's the uh, the text that tells us how to actually read the Hebrew words. So there, these words have dots on them or over them, I should say, all the way up to the ayin in ad. So there are different interpretations of what, in general, those dots mean. There's a Rashi that talks about what either the dots mean that the letters don't belong there or that they are emphasized, exact opposite answers, by the way. So it says here, uh, uh, So there's there's an argument between Rabbi Huda and Rabbi Nechemia uh, regarding um okay uh regarding whether um uh how much was known about certain events that occurred when the when Yeshua brought the Jewish people over the Jordan River and into Israel there were certain sins that were done and some people knew about it some people did, didn't etc so uh so it says so the letter um the, the the dot over the ayin represents a, something about the testimony of the Jewish people. So the Baal Haturim, the Kitzur Baal Haturim, brings this up in uh, in his explanation of this parsha, and he says Nikud al ayin shebeid. There is a dot over the ayin over the word ad. Which uh, which is also the spelling of the word aid, or or uh, uh, or testimony, but he says even better. He says like this. He says 
Hadin, as it says in the piece of Sanhedrin that we just mentioned, Sha'ayin Yom Haya. So it was 70 days. It was 70 days from the first of Shvat when Moshe began to explain the Torah until Ad Yud Benisan Sha'avru Hayardin. Until the tenth of Nisan, when they crossed the Jordan. In other words, um, in other words, what we're saying is that there are seventy days between when Moshe started the speech and when the Jewish people actually crossed the Jordan River, which is that incident. That uh, that's related in the Gemara, right? Okay, so So because so the reason for this, the the depth here is that is that the uh, so so. So because of um, because of the seventy days of the speech, and then uh, and then the morning for the thirty days of mourning for Moshe, etc., until, until they actually crossed the Jordan, there was no punishment for uh, for in other words, lanu ulvanein, not for us and not for our children. Nobody sinned for those seventy days. Imagine, imagine seventy clean days. Nobody out of the entire Jewish people, nobody sinned. And that's what these dots are testifying to, the idea that the Jewish people were clean and holy, at least for those 70 days, for the 40 days that they were listening to the speech, for the 30 days of mourning for Moshe, until they crossed into uh, into um, Eretz Yisrael, and they entered into, into Eretz Yisrael 70 days sin-free. That's an amazing thing, right? They were, they were uh, clean of sin for 70 days, when they went into Israel, that's why there's a dot over the iron. Iron is the gematria of seventy. The very other, so uh, alternatively, Rem is Ayin Shana Shal Galut Bavel. Another seventy that this could be alluding to is the seventy years of exile that we were in with with Bavel. Remember, uh, in the time of Bavel, when the, the Babylonians destroyed the temple, they brought the Jews with them to Babylonia. Babylonia was then conquered by Persia, and that was the beginning of the Persian exile, famous story of Esther was at that time, and and then the Jewish people very shortly after that were allowed to go back and rebuild the temple so that with uh, with Ezra. Okay, so that's uh, so, so either way, whatever this 70 refers to, it's, it either refers to the 70 days of of, uh, of spiritual cleanliness the Jewish people had before they went into Israel or the the dot on the top of the uh, on top of the iron which represents 70 might be representative of the fact that Jewish people had to go through this Babylonian exile what the connection between the two is he doesn't explain and maybe it's worth uh, worth our our thinking about it a little bit are we trying to say that during the Babylonian exile we were clean and we were worthy of being rescued were we talking about the uh, the great uh, babylonian jews who saved us and, and 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 through their merits we were able to end the exile quickly like daniel and his friends could be could be is there uh, anything again, on the, not, i'm sorry sorry is there anything on like the 70 elders Any? not in the balatorium i mean maybe somebody else says it I'm just thinking a, that was another bad idea. 70, 70 elders, 70 languages. 70 is uh, is a common uh, number that, that comes up in Torah. Why? Do you say why? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, like you have like seven and what was the other one? like? Well, well seven, seven represents completeness, like a natural completeness. So that's why there's seven days of the week. This is what the morale says. Uh, 70 is the same thing it's just it's 10 and 7 right obviously there's multiplication for you and uh and and it also represents a completeness 
but uh, also natural. That's why there's 70 languages. The 70 elders are supposed to combat, if you want to call it combat, more like uh, sort of balance the influence of the 70 nations. Um, uh, that's why there's 70 uh, oxen that are sacrificed on Sukkot, which is coming up also. Yeah, there's a, there's quite a bit of symbolism, uh, a lot to say, I'm sure. Thank you. Sure. All right. Let's uh, skip along here to the almost next verse. Chapter 30, verse 1. Um, interesting idea, by the way, here from the Ketav Sofer, son of the Khatam Sofer. So it says, So the, so he says, remember, Moshe is trying to get the Jewish people to agree to take on the covenant. And he says that, you know, we, I just promised you all those curses in last week's Parsha, right? Scary stuff, right? You don't want that. So, uh, so just so you know, when that happens to you, when the when falls upon you, all these things, the blessing and the curse, all the things I promised you in last week's parsha. And then you're going to, um, you're go, you're 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 going to think about it while you're in these other nations that Hashem promised you you'd be in. The question that Ketav Sofer asks, though, is, if you, again, if you look at the wording carefully, it says very uh, very clearly, that what will come upon you? A bracha v'haklala. That's what's going to come to mind? The blessing and the curse is going to come to mind when you're in the nations? No. I don't think you're going to be thinking about the blessing very much at that point. When the curse is, when, when the curse is, Fight, you know, when the when when, when you're uh, being attacked by the curses, the last thing in your mind is going to be the the blessings, right? Or you would think. So what? What? Why are why are the blessings being even mentioned here? So very strange. So Ketav Sofer says, "Ki yavo alacha bracha v'haklala shishnehem yachad yavo aleinu." They will both come upon you at the same time. This is a beautiful idea. Think about it. And the, 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 the curse will, when, when, it, when it happens upon you, when you're in exile, that's also a bracha. Right? They, they come at the same time. The, remember, where did they come from? He birkat Hashem matzil otanu miyad harayim haomdi malenu Tummy, they, they, these these terrible curses are going to come upon you from where? From Hashem. That's a blessing. He, that means he still cares about you. You're in exile. He kicked you out. He seems to hate you, but he doesn't hate you because he wants you back. He's giving you punishments in exile to get you to do tshuva to get you to come back. So 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 even that the bracha and the kala they are always together really. That's uh, from the from the pasuk that you, this will come to mind to you when uh, when you're uh, when you're in these nations that uh, you're in exile with with whom you're in exile uh, in which you're in exile uh, anyway whatever it is you're going to think about it how, how is it possible for this one little sheplach, the Jewish people, one little sheep, to be surrounded by these groups of wolves, right? We've been attacked and mis, uh, misused by so many of the nations of the world over, over our, our history. It's, it's, it, how, how is it possible that we're going to be, that we're able to have survived? What, what is it that got us through all this? Al yidei zeh. That's thought. Wait a minute. We're sheep. We're one little sheep surrounded by the, all these wolves, and we haven't been destroyed completely. I wonder why that is. Oh, wait a minute. That makes sense. It's because Hashem loves us. <laughs> all this time, He's been protecting us and saving us. 
שבעת שמתנהג עמנו בדין, when Hashem is acting towards us with din, as with nahe gam ke bechesed, even then, even when he's punishing us, even then he's showing us chesed, how much he loves us. Chesed berachamim, l'chein amar Hashem al-kecha, that's why he says, Hashem your God, rachamim v'din yachad. Remember, we've talked many times about how there's different names for Hashem. Hashem, the Yud, and hey, and vav, and hey, name, the Hashem havaya, is usually a reference to Hashem's rachamim, Hashem's love, and Elokecha is a uh, is a reference to Hashem's judgment. So when, especially when it's used together like this, like it is in this parsha, in this verse, Hashem Elokecha Shama. Hashem, your God, Hashem, the loving one. Hashem, the judging one, put you there. The love and the judgment are, at, are both at the same time. They're both ex- different expressions of how much Hashem actually loves us and cares for us. Beautiful idea from the Ketav Sofer. And a great way, by the way, worth mentioning. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a lot of drushes, uh, maybe even one you might hear on, on Shabbat about this. Uh, th- there's a-, a lot to say about how, but that's what Rosh Hashanah is, right? Rosh Hashanah is a time of judgment, but that's why there are those three th- things that we're supposed to remember, right? There's the, the three things we mentioned in the Shemona Esrei, the Shofrot, the Zichronot, the Malchiot. Yes, the Malchiot, Hashem is king, Hashem is the judge, Hashem is all-powerful, Hashem can do anything he wants. He can strike us all down with lightning, Chas But Zichronot, what's Zichronot? What are we remembering? We're remembering that Hashem loves us. We're, we're standing here. We're, we're standing in, in, uh, in Shimon Esrei on this Yom Hadin. Hashem didn't destroy us. He gave us a chance even now to do Teshuvah. So that's this uh, beautiful idea that can be applied very well to our current situation. I want to go back now a little bit. No, a lot a bit. We're going to go back now to the creation of the world. Okay? We're going to go back to Bereshit, chapter 3, verse 22. And you'll see why in a moment. We have a stira. What's a stira? A stira is a contradiction. We're going to see a contradiction between a Ramban, it's commentary on Bereshit, 3.22, and a Ramban in this week's Parsha, in Nitzavim, Chapter 30, verse 6. Okay? Um, I heard this from Rabbi Isaac Bernstein, and he shows this seeming contradiction between the Ramban, and then, very beautifully, he brings an answer from a Nefesh Achayim. So as we'll see, there's going to be quite a bit to glean from the wisdom in the Torah and the Ramban and Rabbi Isaac Bernstein, Zechat Tzadok All right, chapter 3, verse 22, it says, uh, back, way back when, when Hashem, um, when Hashem uh, is uh, about to punish Adam for eating from the fruit of the, of the Eitz Sadat Tovara, the, the, the tree of wisdom, of good and evil. It says, Elokim. Again, Hashem Elokim. Interesting, right? So we got we have both his, his chesed and his din here. Hein ha'adam haya ke'echad mimenu. Now Hashem, now this Adam is going to be like one of us. He's talking to the angels. That's what most people explain. He's going to know good and evil. Now, pen yishlach yadov lakach gam me'es ha'chayim ve'achal v'chay olam. And now he's going to reach out and take from the tree of life, and he's going to live forever. We can't have that. We can't have him be as intelligent as us, again, talking to the angels, assuming, uh, and, and, and also live forever. We can't have that at the same time. So on the idea of v'ata, and now, says the Ramban, <clears throat> Hashem wanted for 
Adam to be able to fulfill his his um, responsibility of eventually dying. There's a responsibility man has, or this particular man, Adam, had, that he wouldn't live forever. But originally he should have lived forever, and then Hashem wanted it so that he wouldn't live forever, basically. Right? If Adam would eat from the tree of life, then he would, obviously, he would shirk that responsibility. He would then be able to live forever, and then he would never die. Oh, Oh, so either he would never die, or the day that he was supposed to die would never come, and this the time would freeze or whatever, whatever it is. Vihine ata, and that's why he says. And now, like in our in the verse here, it says it says lo b'chira shamar ha'etz hazem imenu. Now that he has. Now that he has bechira, now that he has free choice, so now because because he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? So now he uh, now we have to kind of we have to mar We have to we have to keep this tree, the tree of life, away from him. Why? Because originally, before he ate, in other words, from the tree of knowledge, he could only do what he was commanded to do, and he didn't have free will. Implication being that by eating of the, the tree of knowledge, good and evil, that's what gave him free will. That's how he's like us, whoever we are. Right, that he has a choice of, of what he can do. He has free will, and that's why he can't live forever. Keep that in mind. That he uh, that Adam's free will kicked in when, when he ate from the tree of knowledge. Up until then, he did not have free will completely, which is interesting. By itself, that's interesting, but it becomes even more interesting when you look at this verse in our parsha. In our parsha, like I said before, chapter 30, verse 6, it says, when the Jewish people come back, when the Jewish people are ready to do tshuva, it says, Umal Hashem Lekecha, again, Hashem Lekecha, et levavcha, he's going to circumcise our hearts, he's going to cut off the fat that's keeping us away from uh, closeness with him, et levav zarecha, and the, the, the hearts of our descendants, of our children, liyahavat Hashem Lekecha, we're going to be able to love Hashem, our God, b'chol levavcha, b'chol nafshecha, leman chayecha. So we're going to be able to love Hashem with all our heart, with all our souls, and that's going to allow us to live. Is that the what first it? time it... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Is that the first time it talks about circumcising the heart? Yes. Is, like, first why and only. Talk, why didn't they talk about it like at the like giving of the Torah? Like circum, I don't know. It sounds like very interesting. So what, what what does it mean to circumcise the heart? Shouldn't we know that first? Well, it's like having a connection with God. That's more like we like we do brisses because like we're His people. So okay, but like, that's not what this is. This is Hashem is going to Hashem is going to do this this uh, circumcision of the heart, not circumcision of of uh, of that, right? And, and and it's going to mean something else as we're about to see in the Ramban. Okay? So the Ramban says, what does it mean to circumcise your heart? This is what the rabbi said um, in, in the Gemara in Shabbat 104a. It says, uh, whoever comes to to purify, he is helped. In other words, Hashem helps him who helps himself, right? Somebody wants to become pure. Somebody wants to become holy. Hashem helps you become holy. Another powerful lesson for this, uh, this season, by the way. You think, uh, you know, Hashem doesn't 
uh, I'm, I'm so far away. I'm not doing what he wants me to do. No, 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 no. Try, put in a little effort. Hashem will give this, this siyata dishmaya. Hashem will finish off the job and you'll be able to be close to him again. So that's part of what it means to uh, to circumcise the heart. Now listen, here's here's where things get uh, dicey. Here's where the Ramban seems to contradict himself earlier. Um, right? So he says, Ki acha shetashu v'ala b'chol levav hu yazor otcha. Because but Moshe is promising you that when you and people, when you return to Hashem with all your heart, Hashem will help you and you'll be able to, then he's going to circumcise your heart. means he's going to help you. That's what it means. It doesn't mean uh, it's going to come from nothing. You're going to try. You're going to put in the effort of being close to him. You're going to put in the effort of being pure. Hashem will finish out the job and you will indeed be pure. Now he saw in, in the Ketuvim, he's going to quote where, uh, where he saw this, that uh, th- to explain what this means, this, the whole idea of circumcising the heart. Because from creation, from creation, originally, it seems, right? It was in a person's hands. It was in man's ability to either do good or bad according to Kirtso no, according to his will. And obviously the rest of the Torah that still exists because you can't be rewarded for good or punished for bad unless that was your choice to do the good or the bad. So that means, says the Ramban here, that your ability to choose good and bad comes from all the way back to the beginning of time. And then he says, and this is, a, I underlined this just for, uh, just for, just for your sake, the Ramban does not underline it. Aval uh, Mashiach betovlahem teva lo halev when Mashiach comes, it's going to be in men's nature to do the good things, to only do good. Why would you ever want to do evil when Mashiach comes? Because your heart won't even think about doing the wrong thing. Your heart will be circumcised. In other words, you will be, you'll have clarity of vision. You'll have clarity of thought. Clear to have philosophy. You're not going to be confused about what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing. Should I support this? Should I support that? Who's which? Which one of these is chesed? Which one of these is din? And there's not going to be any questions about any of that. It's going to be all clear when Mashiach comes. and he's carried kind of that is the circumcision that's mentioned here. Ki because all of these things, the chemda, the tava, your desires, your lusts, and all of these things are the things that are covering your heart and not allowing you to really do the clear, the right thing. Yashuv ha'adam b'zman ha'u v'ashahaya kodem chetod shal adam arishon. And then man will return back to the stage of mankind before the sin of Adam. And what is that, that, what is that stage? Because he's going to only do, in, by nature, he's only going to want to do the right thing. He's not going to have any bad things, any desire to do the wrong thing. 
The, the desire to do the wrong thing came to man when he ate from the tree of knowledge. Other than that, he had clear choice, he had Bechira, he had free will, and he did the right thing all the time. See any problem with what we said earlier from the Ramban? See, in the Ramban earlier we said, back in Bereshit, when Adam actually did the sin with the tree, right? Back then we said that he had he did not have free will. Right? Only now he has free will, now that he ate from the tree. This Ramban is saying, when Mashiach comes, we're going to go back to the stage of before the tree, when man had free will and only did the right thing. And only did the right thing, only because he chose to. So make up your mind, is he choosing to? Or does he not have a choice to? So it seems like a stira in the Ramban. Right? Very clear argument. Did mankind... I'll just uh, spell it out for you here. Did man, did Adam have free will before he ate from the tree of knowledge? So in the, in Bereshit, Ramban says no. Here he's saying yes, he had free will. He had Bechira. Free will worked. Right? That's how free will worked. Okay. So that's the Ramban here. So how can we make sense of this? So that's what I said. I, uh, I already mentioned that the uh, that Rabbi Isaac Bernstein brings here the Nefesh Achaim from part one, gate one. It's, it uh, goes in chapters that are called gates. Shar Aleph, chapter six. And over there towards the middle, towards the end, he explains something very beautiful. Now, it happens to be if you look back in our videos on our uh, on our channel, you'll find in Bereshit of this year, this almost a year ago now, you'll find Bereshit 5783, the class that I give on the Parsha there, we quote this exact same Nefesh Achayim for a similar point. Also about Pechira and free will. So he says, So did Adam HaRishon have free will when he ate from the tree of, of knowledge? So he says, he goes back and forth a little bit. Uh, uh, so did it, this the desire for evil. So the, the, the fact that mankind was now destined to death, as we mentioned, he wasn't going to live forever, is because death itself is going to be a tikkun for his sins. Otherwise, what, what else is death for? Death is for a cleansing. And if you are, if, well, now that you have the ability to sin, now that you have free will, now you're able to do the wrong thing. And now you need a tikkun. And sometimes, for some of Beirut, death is the only tikkun. I'm not saying immediate death, God forbid. But eventually, that's what, uh, that's what death is. That's why death was brought into the world for mankind. He's going to eat from the tree of life, and now he's going to live forever. That's, that would be terrible. So we see, he wrote to Lomers, what are we trying to learn from this? What's the lesson here? What's the lesson here? I'm not much longer. Shikashe yochal me eats hachai and vachai le olam yishar chas v'shalom below tikkun. If he was going to eat from the tree of knowledge, tree of life, he would live a whole life without a tikkun, without a kapara, without cleansing himself of the sin of of disobeying Hashem and eating the food he shouldn't have eaten. Shelo yit pared harami menu. Right, 
uh, Gershu, sorry. Uh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm reading it from the wrong part of the piece. Oh, wow. Hold on a second. Well, this isn't what I want to read to you. I don't have the rest of the piece here. Uh, all right, I'll just, I'll just tell you outside, and then uh, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to attach the right Nefesh uh, Chaim here. Chaim of Olozhner, beautiful piece. So what, what, he, what he ends up saying is this. You have Bechira. You have free will. But there's some things that are so ridiculous to you, you wouldn't ever do them. So it's almost not even the choice. In other words, you see a fire, unless you're a crazy person or trying to make some sort of political statement, you wouldn't walk into the fire. Right? If you're a Tibetan monk, maybe you would. I don't know. But ordinarily, most people don't walk into fires. Because it's ridiculous. That's the Ramban's answer here. That's what he's saying. Back in Bereshit, when the Ramban tells us that Adam Harishon had, uh, did not have free will before he ate from the tree of knowledge, it doesn't mean he didn't have free will. It's because he didn't have the desire for sin. There was nothing so crazy that he wanted to do. He only wanted to do the right thing. He had complete pekira. He had complete free choice. But all of his choices were good choices because he had no reason to do anything wrong except for eating from the tree. As opposed to when he says later on that when Mashiach comes, we're going to go back to the stage where we'll have Bechira and we'll choose the right thing. That's saying the same thing. When Mashiach comes, everything will be clear to us. Our hearts will be circumcised. That's what it means. And everything will be clear to us at that point. That's why it's mentioned, Shane Dole, that's why it's mentioned here and not mentioned in other places, talking about the times of Mashiach. It's not just all the time that Hashem does that for us. Not everybody walks around with that, that kind of clarity. Some people do, I think. But um, people don't, I think. And uh, and so but when when Mashiach comes, that's when we have that kind of clarity that when when we're faced with a challenge, when we're faced with possibly the wrong thing to do, it'll be ridiculous. It'll be I'll use the word stupid to do the wrong thing. It'll just it'll won't make sense. Like why would you? How could you even consider such a thing? They say about they say about the Ten Commandments. Right when the Jewish people received the Sarah Dibrot. And Har Sinai, and Hashem said, thou shalt not steal. The people must have been thinking, that's ridiculous. Why would we steal? Hashem is talking to us. We're hearing Hashem's voice. Okay, at that point, we're listening already to Moshe's voice. Either way, they, they saw, the, they saw the, the thunder, the lightning, all of the miraculous events that were going on. They were clear that there was a God. Why would you want to steal? How could that even enter your head that you're going to take something that doesn't belong to you? Hashem will give you whatever you need. Hashem's giving you mana. Hashem's giving you gold. Your shoes aren't wearing off. You know, you're surrounded by miraculous clouds. Of course you're not going to steal. The Torah wasn't given for that generation. Remember, the Torah was given for our generation, for every generation. Okay. Let's uh, let's skip along here to uh, Devarim. Back to Devarim. Out of Bereshit. Back to Devarim. Uh, chapter 30, verse 1. Verse 11, I apologize. Chapter 30, verse 11. There's a huge and a huge argument, and we brought this up in previous classes. Baruch Hashem, this is, if I'm not mistaken, the fourth uh, Parsha class on uh, on this Parsha. And uh, we're, there's a huge argument about whether the mitzvah that's talked about at the end of this Parsha is the mitzvah of teshuva or the mitzvah of learning Torah? It says, and of course, um, part of that discussion has to do with understanding what this verse means. Ki ha mitzvah hazot, this mitzvah, again, either teshuva or Torah, asher anochi mitzvah hayom that I command you today, 
Lo nifleiti, it's not far for you. Mimcha lo rechoka he, and it's not, uh, and it's not distant. It's not beyond your reach. Anybody can do it. So if we're talking about Torah. So we're talking about how it's uh, Torah is accessible. Torah is not just for a particular place. Um, oh, that's interesting. Ah, uh, all right. So yeah, so we'll we'll see a comment like that from Rav Hirsch shortly. Uh, meanwhile, though. If we're talking about it is teshuva we're talking about, so then we need to explain what this means. What does it mean that it's not far from you and it's close to you? What is that? What is all this? So lo lefleit himimcha means she tetzarech lenevim. It's not far from you that you need nevim. You need you need prophets to figure out how to do the mitzvah. You need prophets to teach you Torah. You need prophets to teach you teshuva. No, you don't. You don't. You can use your own head. You can use your own heart. You know you're doing the wrong thing. You don't need a navi to tell you this, right? Which, which is why for the last, you know, 2,000 years or more, we haven't had navi and we haven't had prophets. We can still have Torah. We can still have teshuva even without that, says the Sforna. Lo rechokahi. And it's not beyond your reach. That you need the elders of the generation to to tell you what to do, to tell you how to do teshuva. So uh, so even in galut, even in exile, Baruch Hashem, as terrible as exile is, Baruch Hashem, we still have Torah. But we don't, and we can still figure out how to do teshuva, even without the greatest, you know, people of the generation telling us, having a sit-down meeting with each one of us individually to tell us how to do teshuva. We have Baruch Hashem, we have Sfarim, we have uh, we have other uh, uh, lessons from from Tanakh and from the Gemara that teach us how to do these mitzvot. Taking this sporno one step further comes along Rav Zalman Saratskin in Aznaim Latora, and he says, Ki a mitzvah hazot, mitzvah ha This is the mitzvah of teshuva. We're talking about teshuva here. It's according to many opinions, etc. Chaim Peshu Bisforno. And this is what Sforno says, uh, that you don't need Nevi'im and that you don't need Chachamim to tell you how to do teshuva. And I want to add to that, as I said, he would. Allah Havav, so he's going to quote the Gemara in Yerushalmi in Makot. She'elu l'chachma chota mahu oncho amru l'ham chataim tirdof ra. Hashem has a conversation with different, this is a, obviously a metaphorical conversation, allegorical conversation. So Hashem says to chachma, says to wisdom, what should I do with them? And uh, the answer is, they're evil. They did the wrong things. They should be punished. Here in the Nevoa, he asks prophecy what to do. Chote, mahu, onshe, amra lahem. So Nevoa answers, ha-nefesh, ha-chotad, hi tamut. So from Yechesko. So the, the Navi would say that somebody who sins should die. So we have Nevoa, we have Vachma, we have wisdom, and we have prophecy, and they both threw us under the bus. Shalu Akodesh Baruchu Chote Mahu Onche Amar Laham Yanesha Teshuva Yichaper Lo. So then Hakadosh Baruchu asks allegorically again himself, "What should be done with the sinner? They should do Teshuva and they should be forgiven." Tichach Amar Moshe Yisrael. 
Al Amru Miyalanu Ashamaima Yikanulanu. So that's why, in other words, we shouldn't go for Chachma or Nivua. Because if we're only going for Chachma and we're going for Nivua, we're going for wisdom. Wisdom is not going to save you from, from your sin. Wisdom is going to say intelligence, right? Science, right? Logic is going to tell you you sinned, you messed up, you're a goner, get out of here. Nivua, you know, Kabbalistic incantations and meditation, you know, the prophets would tell you you're not, uh, you're not holding, you know, you're not in the circle of life, you're not, you, you don't belong here. Okay. So, not wisdom, not meditation, not nevua, not prophecy. Those aren't the things that are going to save you. What's going to save you? The love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, that's a lesson for Rosh Hashanah. The love of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is what's going to save you because he's going to, he's going to just shoot right through, right through wisdom, logic. Logic is going to get exploded. He doesn't care about logic. You know, mysticism is going to be useless. It's a Kaddish Baruch Hu. What, What's important for him? How much you love him. How much he loves you. That love exists through all those other things. That's what it means by, by it's not far from you. So on that subject, then the next verse, the next few verses says, Lo, the Yami, it's not over the sea anymore. My me Yevarlanu at the Evrayam. Who's gonna go over, you know, over the water for us to get this back for us to get this mitzvah? We can't do this mitzvah. It's over the Yam, it's over the ocean, it's too far away, it's over the Atlantic, it's in Israel or whatever. Okay, it's uh, I can't do the mitzvah. It's I'm I'm in San Diego. I can't I can't do this mitzvah, whatever that mitzvah is, whether it's Torah or Shuva, we're gonna see another opinion in just a moment. Uh, who's gonna who's gonna go over to the ocean to grab it for us? How are we supposed to be able to do it and how are we supposed to learn it and do it? Says Rav Hirsch, the knowledge and deeds that it has in mind are not contingent upon circumstances and conditions that exist somewhere in a faraway land. So let's say it's Torah that we're talking about, as you're about to see. So, hence, you cannot say that Torah is appropriate for in other parts of the world. It's, uh, where the climate and social conditions are different. Oh, it's Niyut. Ah, it's Niyut is where it's, you know, where it's cold in the winter. So, uh, uh, so there you can, uh, you know, there, you could, there you could wear the clothing that, uh, that the Chazal tell us to wear. All right. Here, it's, uh, it's different in San Diego. Whatever. Okay. So, it's, uh, social conditions are different. Over there, you know, over there, no one's going to look at uh, people here are going to look at me funny if I'm not showing them my belly button. You know, over there in Israel, you know, in uh, uh, in Russia, wherever, it's over there, okay, I'll, I'll keep snoot. Over here in San Diego, maybe not so important. Says Rav Hirsch, no, no, no. These places, these places are oceans away, and not knowing them prevents me from understanding these laws that I'm supposed to keep. Someone must first cross the sea and study the conditions of the soil of the Torah in its own locality and region to bring us the information that we lack so that we may understand the Torah before fulfilling it. None of the foregoing has any validity. You can't say that. The Torah, it wasn't meant for one particular place, for one particular people. The Jewish people, wherever they're going to be sent into exile, in all of those places, they have to keep the entire Torah. Yes, sometimes there are different community standards. This is not the time for uh, details about that. Uh, that's true. Some things are what's called dat Moshe, you know, whatever. Okay. There are certain standards. But most of the time, halacha is pretty straightforward about what you should do, what you should eat, what you should wear, etc. And we keep that because the Torah, we, we made a promise that we would. The Hashem wants us to be close to him, and that's how we do it. Do we always understand why? We should. We should study that. But if we don't understand why, we do it anyway. And it being originally given somewhere else, or 
our ancestors coming from, you know, from Poland or wherever, where the Torah was easier to keep, or so we think. Those of us who don't know history, you know, can think that all, all we want, but uh, but that's not true. That's not how that worked. The Torah is for all times and in all places. All right, last but not least. We have a little bit of time. I'll try to get through this beautiful piece as quickly as possible. Hopefully it'll be as impactful for you as it was for me when I when I saw it. At the end of the Parsha, Hashem says, I will call heaven and earth to be witnesses against you. Death and life of Fanecha, the life and death are in front of you, a brachva, klala, blessing and curse. Uvacharta Bachayim. Hashem begs us, please, Bachayta, choose life. Laman Tichia Ata Mizarecha, so that you and your children can live. Almost doesn't need commentary. But Rav Moshe finds in Zechet Tzadok Levarachas Chus Yagin Aleinu and Darsh Moshe points out the last few words here are a little bit strange. So that you will live, I get that. So that your children will live, what's that got to do with anything? If I live, my children live. What's what's going on? So he says Lechora. Doesn't make sense how to conclude, choose life so that you and your children shall live. If you look at the reason for this verse, if you don't do good, that's death. Okay? So, obviously, if I do the wrong thing, I'll die. One of children, they'll not be alive. Okay. It seems very redundant to say that I should do this for the life of myself and my children. Nira de Baal Alamadenu comes to teach you. When you choose good, that is life. When you choose life and you're choosing good, you're also inspiring your children and your students with what is good and what is life. You can have somebody who accepts the entire Torah and does all the mitzvot, but they have no impact on their children. Shigam came here to the Kayim. They also need to be built. They need to be established, these children. They need to be inspired. They also need to be inspired to believe in Hashem and in His Torah. Of all Nikar, it's it's recognizable. It's 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 very clear nowadays. Somebody who does all the who believes in Hashem, but does it without simcha. This is a very common thought of Rav Moshe's, right? It's somebody who who takes the Torah and fulfills the Torah, but without the joy. If he makes the the whole the, the whole acceptance of Torah and mitzvot to be a challenge, to be something that uh, he he almost. Uh, uh, regrets or seems to regret so then uh, then we have a problem it's an assignment it's not a joy he makes it seem that maybe it would have been better not to do the Torah and the mitzvot He's cursing his own children. He's cursing his descendants. He's cursing his students. That's the curse. 
because they're going to see what? They're going to see the mitzvot are, are a burden. They're going to say, I don't have it in me to fight my Yetzer and do this thing I don't want to do. I'd rather do what I do want to do. I can go to the beach today or I can go to the stuffy shul today. What should I do? Hmm, tough choice. You don't even want to go to shul. You're going just because you have to. I don't have the strength in me to do what I have to. I'd rather do what I want to. This is the Yiddishkeit. This is the Judaism that Rabbi Moshe saw when he came to America. Let's not kid ourselves. He saw the same thing in Russia too. When you take when you're doing a mitzvah, when you're learning Torah, you should be doing it with a great joy. That is the source of life. There should be a joy in how you do Torah and mitzvot, because if you're not doing Torah and mitzvot with joy, you're basically, you're teaching the people around you that you're doing it out of a burden, and you're, you're doing it because you have to, and you believe in Hashem, okay? But your Hashem is... I mean, is miserable. <laughs> it's, it's 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 not. It's it's. There's no there's no joy in 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 the mitzvah. There's no joy in his relationship with you. There's no love. Where's the love? It's all just I have to because I have to. Your descendants, your children are going to say, I don't feel like I have to, and so they won't. So it's a very dangerous thing. And again, I think very apropos to this time of the year when we're going into the high holiday season, a lot of people start going to shul this time of the year, and it's the hardest day to go to shul because it's the longest service. But if you're going to shul, at least you know don't uh, don't do it begrudgingly. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I get to hear these beautiful melodies. Baruch Hashem, I get to hear the shofar at least on the second day this year. Right, first day is uh, is Shabbat. Right? Baruch Hashem, I get to see people I haven't seen in a while. Baruch Hashem, I get to be closer to Hashem. Baruch Hashem, maybe I'll have the chance to be inspired to keep going to shul every day, every week, whatever it is. That's uh, that's that's the goal. The goal is growth. Everybody's on their own level, obviously, and we're. I'm not I'm not judging anybody. But uh, everybody has the opportunity to grow and to inspire the people around them to grow as well. With that, I'll conclude the class. I'll uh, stop the live feed to Facebook. If there's any questions, now would be a great time to ask. Otherwise, have a Shabbat Shalom.